Welcome to worship, friends. It's such a gift to join with you. I am Susan Boyer, senior pastor of the Laverne Church of the Brethren. This afternoon, Sunday, April 25th, we are having our first in-person outdoor gathering. It's for those 65 and older who pre-registered. We will continue our slow rollout for in-person events. I look forward to seeing those of you I haven't seen for a while. Our third episode of Cooking with Corlin Season 2, planned for this afternoon, is being postponed due to a tragedy in Corlin's family. I invite you to be in prayer for her family. On May 1st, we will send out our monthly email to those on our mailing list. It's filled with information about upcoming events and news. If you don't receive our monthly email and you would like to, you can subscribe to it right off of our homepage at lavernecob.org. We have information in this upcoming email about a Q&A time with Dr. Drew Hart, an upcoming May evening Vesper service on the courtyard, and much more. Our congregation has been invited to participate in an ecumenical event on May 1st. It's called Thank You, Neighbor. The purpose of this event is to thank everyone who kept us going this past year. We will gather in our cars and on the sidewalks of Benita Avenue to celebrate healthcare workers, EMS workers, teachers, delivery drivers, store clerks, and many more. For detailed information about how to participate safely, check out our website at lavernecob.org under the small groups tab. Our nation held its collective breath this week as we waited for the verdict in the trial of Derek Chauvin. There was a sense of relief that he will be held accountable for the death of George Floyd. So let us take a breath and then recommit ourselves to the continued work of healing, learning, and dismantling racism in our nation and in our world. Now may the fire of God's justice burn and may the world be about to turn. My soul cries out with a joyful shout that the God of my heart is great. And my spirit sings of the wondrous things that you bring to the ones who wait. You fixed your sight on your servant's plight, and my weakness you did not. So from east to west shall thy name be blessed, could the world be about to turn. My heart shall sing of the day you bring, let the fires of your justice burn. Wipe away all tears, for the dawn draws near, and the world is about to turn. Depths of the 
the past to the end of the age to be. Your very name puts the proud to shame and to those who would for you yearn. You will show your might, put the strong to fight, for the world is about to turn. My heart shall sing of the day you bring, let the fires of your justice Tower, not a stone will be left on stone. Let the king beware, for the justice tears every tyrant from his throne. The hungry poor will weep no more, for the food they can never burn. There are tables spread, every mouth be fed, for the world is about to turn. My heart shall sing of the day you bring, that the fires of your justice Welcome to Children's Time. I'm Erica Schatz. I'm also known as Miss Schatz to my students. I'm a teacher and like you guys all year long, I have been on the computer with my students, with students like you. And it's been hard, hasn't it? It was not an easy process and it's still not easy. But when I think back to the beginning of this pandemic and teaching and learning and to where we are now, I've realized we've all come so far. You've come so far. There has never been a generation of students that have done this before. You're pioneers. You have learned how to become the best listeners ever. <laughs> Usually in school, we're doing things hands-on or we're there, but now you're learning to listen. We know how to Zoom. We know how to do Google Meets. Hey, you've learned how to turn your mics on and off now. Okay, some of us are still learning how to do that, <laughs> but you get it. We have picked up skills that no one has had before. You are pioneers in this. No one's had to learn like this before. You should feel so proud of yourselves of all that you've accomplished and all that you've learned how to do. I bet you know how to make a PowerPoint or Google slide presentation so well now, whereas maybe a few years ago, you couldn't. I'm getting ready to go back to school. I'm actually here right now in my classroom. You might hear the echoing because it's so empty. Things are different. I don't get to do things the same way and you don't get to learn the same way. Some of you will be back in school with desks that are all spaced apart or um, seats that are empty next to you. And that's just how it is now, but we can still do it. And you're learning how to adapt. You're learning how to be patient with your teachers who are struggling with technology. I mean, even now coming back to school, as you come back to school, it's going to be learning in a different way. No more small groups at the carpet, reading a story. We're all gonna be spaced apart, but we can still do it. And that's the thing. We just come with the right attitude and we're happy that we're here and we get to be together. And even those of you that are still learning from afar, learning from distance, you're still together. And I think that's the greatest thing that we've kind of learned as students and teachers during this pandemic is that we can still be a community and still be together, even though we're far away. And we can still have fun learning together. It just looks different. 
And now when the pandemic is over and we finally get to go back to school full time, one day with no mass, you're gonna have all of this knowledge and you're gonna be able to do your presentations like a PowerPoint presentation or a Google slide presentation like nothing. When you look back on this year, I want you to embrace it and recognize all those skills you have learned. You have grown so much thanks to this year and the way you've had to learn. Bye. A woman driving around a hairpin turn on a narrow country road swung a bit wide and forced a man coming in the opposite direction to swerve sharply in order to avoid a collision. To add insult to injury, or so it seemed, as the woman passed by the man, she cried out, Pig! He thought to himself, well, there's a crass ignoramus, and he shouted back at her, Idiot! and he rounded the curve and crashed into the biggest pig that he had ever seen. Live and learn. As we contemplate an offering today, I hope we can avoid a collision between our desire to support the church we love and our tendency to put it off until another day. Be generous. Hello, my name is Anita Smith Buckwalter. One of the benefits of the COVID-19 pandemic has been the gift of finding a worshiping home with this faith community that's centered at the Laverne Church of the Brethren. Nearly 2000 miles from where I live in Michigan. During the past year, we've experienced huge changes increasing uncertainty and heightened turmoil. One thing that helps me meet all these ups and downs is to pay attention to my breath. I love the Bible verse that tells us that when we have no words, God prays in us with our breath. Will you breathe with me now? I also like to remember the Genesis story. In the beginning, Creator God formed the first earthlings from the soil and blew the breath of life into them. The Hebrew word for that breath is ruach. Saying the word is like breathing. Ruach. With each breath, God is present in us. Even when we aren't thinking about it. Ruah. Ruah also means spirit and wind. Ruah. 
breath of God in me. <sighs> breath of God in you. Breath of God in everyone we know. Breath of God in every person on the planet. Breath of God in all the creatures in the world. Breath of God in all living things on earth. Breath of God in the cosmos, the whole universe. In whatever happens next. In times of weeping and times of laughing. In times of tearing down and times of building up. in times of keeping and times of giving away. In times of silence and times of speaking. In times of fighting and times of reconciling. In times of living and times of dying. God prays in us with each breath. Amen. My name is Juliet Davis, and I'll be reading Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verses 1 through 8. For everything there is a season, and a time for every matter under heaven, a time to be born, and a time to die, a time to plant, and a time to pluck up what is planted, a time to kill, and a time to heal, a time to break down, and a time to build up, a time to weep, and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to throw away stones and a time to gather stones together, a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing, a time to seek and a time to lose, a time to keep and a time to throw away, a time to tear and a time to sow, a time to keep silence and a time to speak, a time to love and a time to hate, a time for war, and a time for peace. It was five years ago this past week that I became a widow. Five years and there still isn't a day. I don't think about how I wish it had turned out differently. Add a pandemic to this story and now I'm not just a woman living alone, I'm also working remotely, separated from all the people I love and who give meaning to my life. I'm not telling you this because I want your pity. 
I'm telling you this because it has been a year that has accentuated our losses for all of us, whatever our living circumstances. Whether we're widowed, divorced, single, married, unable to see children or parents, grandchildren or grandparents, living in a retirement community and needing to take all of our meals alone in our room or trying to raise small children without the usual support systems or needing space from family while you feel trapped together in the same small bubble. Add to that the loss of health or loss of job or death of a loved one. This has been a year of loss and suffering for every person on the planet. The fact that this is a global phenomenon means that We're all navigating this strange time, no matter where we live or our circumstances. We humans are suffering this pandemic together while alone and apart from each other. Two thirds of Americans believe that COVID-19 is a message from God, but what's the message? Only 11% understand it as a punishment of God. Thank God that the usual level of vitriolic judgmentalism that declares a pandemic being God's punishment has been almost missing from the airwaves. Most people of faith are approaching the pandemic with heartfelt questions. It's been a year of soul searching, individually and corporately. Why did this occur? How do we make sense of it? How has the pandemic changed us? What has this year of suffering taught us about ourselves and about God. Who do we need to be going forward? A couple months before my husband Brian died, our son Matt emailed me an article about Stephen Colbert that he wanted me to read. It was a profile on Colbert right before he became host of The Late Show. It wasn't a fluff piece. It was a quite a long article. The journalist who wrote it commented on how it surprised even him that the article turned out to be about loss and change and and what we make of it. Stephen Colbert is the youngest of 11 children, and when he was 10, his father and his next two oldest brothers died in a plane crash. The rest of his siblings were grown and out of the house, so that just left Stephen and his mother at home. He was traumatized and forever changed. He said that when he was 35, he came to the realization that he had to learn to love that which he most wished had not happened in his life. He didn't want to lose his father and his brothers, but it's our choice whether to hate something in our lives or to love every moment of them, even the parts that bring us pain. After I read the article, I said to my husband, can I, can I read you this article that Matt sent me? Like Stephen Colbert, Brian lost his father when Brian was just 10 years old and the only child still left at home. I wondered what he would think of Colbert's take on loss and, and what we make of it. When I finished reading it, I looked over and Brian was weeping and I began to apologize for reading him the article. But he said, don't be sorry. Just read it to me again. Over the last five years, I have reread that article many, many times. Anderson Cooper, a primary anchor on CNN, who also lost his father at the age of 10, was so moved by the article, he did a television interview of Colbert. In it, you see two men who experienced the same loss. Two wounded souls discussing loss and how to make sense of it. At one point, Colbert says to Cooper, it's a gift to exist, and with existence comes suffering. There is no escaping that. We will all die someday, and before we do, we will lose one person or many who matter to us. It's the truth of being alive. And it makes me think of the scripture that Juliet read to us today from Ecclesiastes. For everything there is a season and a time for every matter under heaven. 
In our lifetimes, we will have sunrises and sunsets, joys and sorrows, sickness and health, life and death, ups and downs, planting and harvesting, laughing and crying. It doesn't matter how well educated you are or how much money you make or how altruistic you are or how much you follow the rules. We will all die and we will all suffer loss. It is the fact of living. The author of Ecclesiastes, who we'll call the preacher, has a pessimistic view of our time on this earth. Think Murphy's Law meets Scripture. Anything that can go wrong will go wrong. The preacher writes, the race, the race is not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong, nor bread to the wise, nor favor to the skillful. But time and chance happen to them all. The New Testament equivalent would be rain falls on the good and the evil alike. Ecclesiastes' advice is, since life is in essence senseless, go ahead and eat and drink and be merry, for tomorrow you will die. The preacher in Ecclesiastes was stating what we all know academically, and Donna said it in her sermon two weeks ago. None of us is getting out of this alive. What makes me read the same article over and over again is that Colbert takes a long, hard look at his suffering and loss, and he doesn't end up resigned. He has learned to embrace the very thing he wished had never happened. Five years out, and I'm still confounded by the beauty of that decision. In the article, Colbert quotes J.R. Tolkien, author of the Lord of the Rings series. What punishments from God are not gifts? When I first read that quote, I interpreted Tolkien's meaning to be that our losses are punishments from God inflicted on us to teach us something. That's just not an understanding of God I can square with anything else I know. I learned later that Tolkien penned those words in response to a query from a reader about his characters in the Lord of the Rings books. Tolkien compares the mortality of humans to the immortality of his elf characters who actually covet mortality. Tolkien says that humans have a higher destiny than elves who never die. Tolkien writes, the creator will make punishments, that is changes of design, produce a good, not otherwise to be attained. Out of loss comes blessing. Out of suffering, we glimpse the depth of love. Stephen Colbert says it like this. We're asked to accept the world that God gives us and to accept it with love. If God is everywhere and God is in everything, then the world as it is is all just an expression of God and God's love. And you have to accept it with gratitude. You have to be grateful for all of it. You can't pick and choose what you're grateful for. So what do you get from loss? You get awareness of other people's loss, which allows you to connect with that other person, which allows you to love more deeply and to understand what it's like to be a human being. That's how Colbert has learned to love the very thing in his life he most wished had never happened. That's how he made the choice to embrace the most painful thing in his life, for out of it has come deeper love, a deeper connection. It has shaped him. Many years ago, I heard Madeline Lingle, author of A Wrinkle in Time, speak. One thing she said resonated so deep in my bones, I've never forgotten it. She said, if you dig down deep enough and just keep digging, you will always find love at the foundation. I find that in the lyrics of Sean Kirchner's song, Holy World. And I have seen how hopes slip away, slip away like shifting sand, only to reveal the rock and a place to stand. Holy world, where sorrows are turning with joy. This pandemic has brought our losses front and center. It has required us to turn them over and over again as we study them, to dig down deep and see what we find below them, to ask ourselves what we will do with this one wild and precious life we've been given. 
Can we take what life gives us and embrace life in all its fullness? The seeking and the losing, the dancing and the mourning, the reaping and the sowing? Can we witness our sorrows turning with joy? Now, I want to be clear that I'm not saying that suffering is a virtue in and of itself. I'm not saying that the person with the most adversity in this life wins or is the most evolved. No, I'm saying that there is sacredness in our suffering, that you can find God even there. The question is, can we embrace life in all its fullness, all of it in all its varied seasons? Can we see giftedness in all experiences? Can we take this past year and find in it goodness, love, beauty, even in it? Can we see how it shapes us now and embrace it? This past weekend, my son Brett came for a whirlwind visit. He wasn't even here for two full days, and we packed a lot of living into those few hours. Because of the pandemic, Brett and I hadn't been together at my house since October. Of course, I had things I needed him to do for me, which he graciously did. But we talked more deeply than we ever have. We each shared what we had learned in this pandemic year. We talked about the loss of his father and how Brian's life gifted us both. We reflected on how the suffering and isolation of this past year has taught us the importance of now. We dug down deep, and love just gushed up all over us. And our sorrow turned with joy. Amen. Sure.
it is a gift just to exist in all of the varied seasons of this holy, holy world. Embrace this life and all the ways that it shapes you. And may the God of love be found in all of it. Amen.